Uh, how many people here um, is this for your first time being exposed to the magic and the, the nightmare that is me? <laughs> All right. My name is David Snyder. I am a certified practitioner and trainer in neurolinguistic programming. I'm a licensed acupuncturist and diplomate of oriental medicine. I'm licensed with the state of California. Uh, medically and clinically, my specialty is the treatment and elimination of illness that, ha that has as its cause repressed emotion. I'm also uh, a certified hypnosis trainer. I've authored at least 15 different programs on conversational and covert hypnosis. I teach persuasion and influence seminars as well as very, very high level private seminars to influence professionals all over the world. In 2005, I was voted one of the top 10 attraction and seduction experts <laughs> by SeductionLayer.com and The Art of Approaching. Now, why am I telling you all this? To make you feel good and impress you? No, to impress me. Um, <laughs> but what do all these things have in common? What the heck does oriental medicine have to do with NLP, have to do with attraction and relationships, have to do with what other things did I say? Persuasion and influence. It's not what you think. Two words, pattern recognition. The ability to do Chinese medicine very, very well is based on your ability to observe subtler and subtler changes in the human body, in the emotions. We were taught to pay attention to things that the average human being has no clue have any relevance whatsoever to other parts of their body and mind. Okay? And so for many, many years, I have been focused on disciplines, including the, by the way, I'm also a very a lifelong martial artist. I teach self-defense. I'm a certified instructor for the Just Yell Fire program, which is a women's self-defense program, uh, which is actually really cool. Um, but for those of you who have no desire to actually become a black belt, it's probably the best thing you can, you can take. I teach Sistema, which is also a very mind-based, mind-centered martial artist, specifically taught to uh, the Russian Special Forces. Okay. I'm an eighth degree black belt in an art called Kyusho Kempo, or Kyusho Jitsu, which is the art of vital point fighting. Again, what do all these things have in common? It's learning how to understand and pay attention to the body in ways that most people don't even realize are possible. Okay. Tonight's, to tonight's topic is lie detection. So how are we getting from all that stuff to lie detection? When I was in my undergraduate, I've always been fascinated by, anybody here old enough to know who, who Quincy was? Yeah, I won't tell. Well, you guys have all seen CSI and, and all these all the cop shows that have all these profilers on them, right? Well, Quincy was kind of like the original guy, played by Jack Klugman. He was, he's calling right now, even though he's dead. <laughs> by the way, please turn your cell phones off. Okay. Um, I'm going to do as, I'm going to give you as much as I can in the time we have, but I need to give you some background on me so you understand why this might be important to you and how it's relevant. Okay. Um, so yeah, Quincy was like the guy. He would like figure stuff out and all these things. Then of course came shows like Lie to Me. Yeah, how many people have ever seen that, the show Lie to Me? Okay. Uh, if you haven't, you should go out and rent every season. Uh, the man who was the consultant for that show, Dr. Paul Ekman, is probably the world's leading authority on emotions, facial cues, facial recognition cues, and lying. Okay. Uh, he was a consultant for that show, so there's a lot of really good science and a little bit of embellishment here and there. Uh, but it's all very, very useful. Tonight's topic is very deep. Very, very deep. And it's one that's very, very personal to me. And I'll tell you why that is. Two reasons. A, I've always been fascinated by this stuff. But there was another reason. There was a much more personal reason. My life, especially my early childhood, I, ha I was the, the classic bullied kid. Okay. I was overweight, I, was, I wasn't athletic, I was pretty gullible and highly emotionally sensitive. And so for me, uh, I was lied to on a pretty regular basis. I, I did just about anything you could think of to, uh, to get people to like me, or because I thought people liked me. And uh, as it turns out, more often than not, I was on the wrong end of a very vicious and powerful lie. So I became, for lack of a better word, slightly traumatized. Okay. I developed what is known in the PTSD field and, and that world as hyperacuity syndrome. Very mild form, but enough to kind of force me to really kind of be in a constant state of, you know, out outward awareness, constantly looking for enemies, constantly looking for people trying to hurt me. Okay? Now, I didn't know at the time that that fear response, which really is what it was, would turn out to be one of the most useful and powerful blessings 
that I would ever have. Okay? I became fascinated and obsessed with learning how to look at somebody and with a high degree of accuracy, know if they were lying to me, know if they were telling me the truth, and being able to predict what they were going to do next in any given situation. Now, predicting what people are going to do next is not the topic of tonight's uh, course, but it, the, the, lawyer, the, 20, the 30 plus lawyers who I try consult with, who regularly speak to judges, juries, and expert witnesses, find that very useful. <laughs> okay? As a hypnotist, as a person who sees people with severe emotional problems or pain that just won't go away, I find it extremely useful. Because just like with oriental medicine, just like with people who are liars, liars, patterns tend to repeat. Patterns tend to become obvious. But if you don't have the foundation, you can't see what's right in front of you. Does that make sense? So that being said, what I'm going to share with you tonight, if this is the, the, the pure spectrum of all there is to know about understanding the nonverbal world we live in, we have enough time to cover maybe my cuticle. Okay, so first things first, um, without getting too deep, I'm just going to go around just a couple of t people who look, who look like they don't want to be called on. By the way, this means yes, this means no, all right, I'm sorry, this means yes, this means no. <laughs> I lied to you, see, you didn't catch it. This means I know the answer, please call on me. This means I don't know the answer, please don't call on me. This means, oh shit, I hope he doesn't call on me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> please make yourselves at home, you know, just come on in. I won't point too many of you out coming in late, but that's all right. Um, so let's talk about lying real quick. Um, how many different kinds of lies are there? You, hiding over in the corner. Okay. Uh, one. One? Okay. What, what kind of lie would that be? The kind that's not the truth. The kind that's not the truth. Ooh. <laughs> There's exaggeration. Exaggeration, okay. Um. Uh, Another kind of lie, other than exaggeration, mm -hmm. would be the opposite of the truth. <laughs> the opposite of the truth, yes. It's the little white ones. The little white ones. Is lying always bad? That's a great, great, great input. Is lying always bad? No. Okay. When I last time I taught this this particular course was about probably a little over a year, maybe I'm going on two years ago. The first thing I asked the room was, or I told the room was. Listen, before you go on this path, you better be darn sure you want to know the answer. Okay, let me give you a, a, an ugly truth about lies and believing them. People don't believe lies because they have to. They believe lies because they want to. Okay, anytime your emotion gets involved, anytime your reptile brain gets involved, reality changes and how you process reality changes. So let's go into the neuroscience behind this. You guys know you have three brains, right? Oh, well, let's start there. What, are you going to answer the question, how many lies are No. <laughs> no, actually, you have, you have three basic kinds of lies. You guys all know, the, you guys all know that, um, that, that oath you have to take whenever you go to court. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The brilliance of that is that it encompasses all three kinds of lies. Yeah. So lies of omission, lies of misdirection, or lies of perception. We call those convincing, or lies of convincing or lies of influence. We'll talk. Those are the most insidious kinds of lies, and they're the kinds that you will more likely run into than, than not. Omissions and, and lies of influence are probably the most common ones. It takes an awful lot of cojones and, and guts to give per somebody a bald-faced lie to their, you know, just look them right in the eye and tell them something that's not true. Not that don't, people don't do it all the time, but it takes a lot of energy and it, and it creates a lot of stress in the body, unless you're a psychopath or a sociopath, in which case what will give you away is how much joy you're taking in it, if you know what to look for, okay? The, uh, the experts call that duping delight, duping delight, okay? So we have lies that are just blame lies, they're just directly opposite of the truth, right? So we'll just call those lies of, I don't want to use the word deception to say lies, but we'll just say that. And we have lies of omission, and then lies of influence. At the end of the day, though, it's just something that isn't true or 
forces us to look in a different direction so that we don't ask the questions that pinpoint these. That's, what, that's why these are, the lies of influence are so important to understand, is they, they move you off the target. They move you away from asking the right questions. Okay? And we'll, we'll work up to that as much as we can, but we have to really give you guys a foundation. Okay? By the way, how many people have ever been lied to? Okay, just, just, just checking. Every now and then, like I ask really weird questions, sometimes like, how many people here have ever been a little kid? And everybody raised their hand except one guy going, what, did you pop out fully formed? What? Okay. But they're important questions, right? Here's one thing you need to know as a hypnotist. And you probably never thought of because most people have probably never seen a hypnotist or gone to a hypnotist for anything because most people don't go to a hypnotist until they've been to the doctor, the chiropractor, the lawyer, the clergyman, the faith healer, and the witch doctor. And then they wind up in my chair. In the fair. In the, fair. One the fair. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But one of the things that, ha that we have in hypnotherapy is this thing called the presenting problem. The presenting problem is a lie. It's always a lie. Somebody comes to you and says, I'm 50 pounds overweight, I need to get my, my lifestyle under control. They're lying. You can look at them and say, they're 50 pounds overweight, how can, they, you know, how can that be a lie? Because the fat is just a symptom. If they consciously knew why they were overweight, they would have fixed it. And that goes back to this three levels of the brain we were just talking about. The first level of your brain is called the reptile brain, okay? And don't be offended, you all have one, okay? But it's the part of us that is in charge of pretty much every politically incorrect drive, every off-color remark that we, for, we refuse to voice and then sometimes let slip. You guys know what I'm talking about? Your reptile brain. This is your brain on David. Okay. The Russians or the Soviet uh, sports psychologists would call this your paleocortex. It's in charge of your primal drives, survival, sex, or reproduction in this case. Uh, social needs. You know that sounds weird for a reptile, right? We'll explain that in a minute. Uh, food. First thing that happens anytime you interact with somebody, whether they're new or not, your brain kind of goes, are they a threat? Can I mate with it? Do I eat it? <laughs> if the answer is no to any of those questions, they lose interest. Okay? The problem, of course, is what the heck is this social need thing? How do social needs factor into the reptile brain? Well, as a social being, society, we have learned through evolution, through millions of years of trial and error, that society protects its high status members, first and foremost. You ever, anybody here ever seen the movie Joe versus the Volcano? or any movie where the natives of some island somewhere are sacrificing the beautiful virgin to the volcano god. Okay, sure. we've all seen that. Well, why the heck are they sacrificing the beautiful virgin and not the medicine man or the general or the chief? Because virgins are a renewable resource. <laughs> <laughs> Society protects its high status members. This is why even in our modern culture today, we are driven to seek the approval of people who we view as having more money, more size, more resources, more physical health, and more beauty. These are status markers. They're things our reptile brain targets on. And it uses that appraisal to sort, is the person lower status than me, the same as me, or higher than me? And the moment, just watch any, any group of, of guys get together who don't know each other for the, you know, watch them for the first 20 minutes. The first 20 minutes are all jockeying for position to figure out who the alpha is. And it's, there's, there's organized chaos as everyone tries to outdo the other one. And then all of a sudden, at some point, there's a click. The alpha male is decided and everybody falls into place. Wow. Hmm? Did you say why? Wow. I said wow. No, you just got to observe. See, I'm going I'm to bring your, as, as progressively as I can, 
There's so many people in this room, I don't know if we'll be able to, to do any drills without actually getting into fist fights and doing weird things to each other with you know, coffee cups or something. But it's okay to laugh. Guys gotta stop taking yourselves way too freaking serious. You know that, right? Okay? This is one of the problems that we have, is we're too freaking serious, which usually cuts us off from the most important resources we have, our ability to roll with the punches. Okay? But getting back to this, so one of the things that we have to understand about social needs as a survival drive, Remember, your reptile brain is in charge of your primal drives, not your emotions, okay? All feelings, all emotions are feelings, but not all feelings are emotions, okay? And the drives that get starved are the ones that get the most attention paid to them. Now, we'll come back to that later because this is one of the reasons why a lot of guys lie to women. <laughs> all right, not that that's relevant, right? Because no woman here's ever been lied to by a guy, right? Never going. I don't want to answer that. Yeah. <laughs> By their mechanics. By their mechanics? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's where the ladies go in. They, then they, they 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 trust the mechanic, right? He comes back. You know, three hours later, goes first out of his. This is where you know they're going to lie to you. First words out of their mouth. Do you want to keep this car? <laughs> Anybody ever heard that? <laughs> Oh yeah, we'll, we'll get into that, trust me. I have a whole line of inquiry on that stuff, right? But here's the thing, the questions that you would ask are useless if you don't know what to look for, if you don't know what to listen for, and how they combine. Does that make sense? Okay. We lie to satisfy our primal drives if we don't see any other way to do it. The other way that this goes back, uh, the, the social needs go back to survival is as social beings, and this is extremely important in terms of influencing people and understanding it, ostracism from the group, being excluded from the group, is equivalent to extinction. Or, to put it more bluntly, death. Now, when I say death, everyone in the room goes, just like when I say sex. Your reptile brain goes, what? He said, what? Where? Right? I can literally just, for the rest of the night, go, death, sex, sex, death. And you'll be like, wow! Why? Because the, mo <laughs> the moment I, <laughs> look at you, look at your reaction. You're all paying attention now. You were zoning off before one, can I get some coffee? Some chocolate, maybe? I say sex, you go, whoa, forget the coffee, we're good now. Because the moment we tweak you in the brainstem, we, the moment we activate your primal drives, we get about 20 minutes of attention. Okay? This is one of the reasons, strategically, why you'll hear me make a lot of off-color remarks. Okay? Ostracism from the group is death to the reptile brain. This is why you do a lot of the things you do and that you hate yourself for. Because the group is doing it. Okay? In, in my influence classes, which again, this is not the, the influence side of things, it's the, in, the intelligence gathering side of things, I tell my people that, uh, what the heck do I tell them? I just drew a blank there. I must be out of blood sugar. Anyway. <laughs> Cookie. <laughs> no. Um, there's three eyes in, in the world, according to David. There's identity, intelligence, and influence. The most powerful indicator of the results you're going to produce in your life are, is your, is the, are the foundations of your identity, who you are in your world and the people you interact with. If you're a high status member in your cliques or your niches, you can get away with pretty much anything you want and the group will follow your lead. If you're one of the herd, not so much. Right? And there's always a runt of the litter, right? There's always the one in the group that's picked on the most, right? Patterns. You can see, and it doesn't matter if you're male or male or female, if you're in a club that you know, rides motorcycles across you know, the country, you know, whether you're you know, in a stamp collecting club, there's always gonna be an alpha, there's always gonna be the herd, and there's always gonna be the one who gets the brunt of the boost, okay? It's just the way it is. I don't make the rules, I just report them. But we need to understand that when the primal drives need to be satisfied, the reptile brain will generate an emotion. It will generate some form of stress either good stress or bad stress. When that stress hits, 
everything you pay attention to, everything you think is important, will change. One of the things that uh, Dr. Paul Ekman, you've heard me mention him already, is an expert on is the, the calibration and quantification of emotional cues in the face. Okay? He, he isolated these things called micro-expressions. You guys ever hear that term, micro-expressions? They're expressions that go to the seven core basic emotions, anger, grief, or sadness, surprise, disgust, or, or contempt. They're a little bit different. Um, joy and surprise. And they can appear and disappear on the face in as much as 1 25th of a second. Okay? They're usually not, con they're not controllable most of the time by the average human being. Now, we're, we're going to talk about microexpressions a little bit, but we're not going to get into them because you need some training. But I want you to understand that the other pro part of that, that research that went into that facial coding activation system that Dr. Ekman created was the intense study of emotions. And one of the first things that Dr. Ekman discovered was something called the emotional refractory period. Okay? Why am I talking about all this instead of lies? Because in order to catch a liar, you have to know what's affecting your perceptions. Remember I said at the beginning of the training that people don't believe lies because they have to. They believe them because they want to. Why do they want to? The emotional payoff. It's that simple. Okay? So what happens is when, you're when you want to satisfy a drive, your unconscious mind gener generates an emotion that forces you to take action on it. But many times, the drive you're trying to satisfy and the way you really want to do it is at odds with your, so your, your socialization. It's at odds with the way you were brought up. It's at odds with the culture you're working in either corporate or religious or whatever. So what do we do? We activate the third level of our brain. This is called the neocortex. To put it more bluntly, it is your rational, lying brain. Now here's the cool part. What is it called again? It's called the neocortex. It's the newest part of your brain, or literally the new layer. So you think primal drives, this middle brain here is your emotional brain, it's your mammalian brain, otherwise known as your limbic system. Probably didn't cover that, I should probably put that out there. It's your emotional brain. Is that the second layer? Yes. Okay, so you have a drive, it generates an emotion, and then you come up with a story that justifies it to two entities simultaneously, well actually three simultaneously. You, the society in which you're operating, and depending on how religious you are, God. And many times these rationalizations have absolutely nothing to do with the real reason you're doing them. But they sound good. This is what we call the presenting problem in hypnotherapy. Somebody comes in and they say, I'm 50 pounds overweight, I can't control my eating, I need you to help me lose weight. And I pretend to believe them. Because I'm a, comp I'm a caring, compassionate therapist. And then I go and I put him in trance and I talk to the boss. The boss is your unconscious mind. And you find out that when you take them back to the very first scene, situation, or event that has everything to do with that feeling, everything to do with why that weight is there, it's because when they were a certain age, somebody did something sexually inappropriate and the unconscious mind, in its desire and fervor to protect them, said, well, wait a minute, why did this happen? Well, it happened because I'm attractive. Okay, so then if I'm not attractive, this won't happen anymore. And the weight comes on. Is the problem that they were fat? No. But if you ask them why they're fat, they'll give you every reason but many times. Because first of all, you can't logically, linearly connect it. Your rationalizing brain, your neocortex is a linear thinker. It's also the part that controls most of your internal dialogue. That little voice in your head, you know the one that just said what voice? <laughs> you can laugh, it's okay guys. I'm gonna try and keep as much levity in this, it's a heavy topic, no pun intended. I'm talking about weight loss, right? <laughs> but this is what's going on. Now, here's the thing. When we begin to try and modulate our primal drives, by the way, your reptilian brain is as honest as the day is long. 
The reptile brain doesn't lie. Most of the time, your emotional brain doesn't lie, but it tries. Lying happens when we try to consciously control and manipulate that process. We try to come up with reasons and justifications that let us escape the consequences of our actions, good or bad. When we start to look for lies, what we're literally looking for are stress responses. Okay? We're looking for stress. We're looking for ways that the body signals a, a, a movement away from equilibrium. Okay? So, that being said, any questions on this before I get into more weird stuff? Is this useful? Yes. Okay. This means yes, this means no. Um, I'm for question. No. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead, Ken. Um, I'm getting confused between the second brain emotional, but emotional connected to the reptilian and getting into the Florida. Well, the lizard bones connect to the monkey bone, and the monkey bones connect to the people bone, but actually, you can think of it just like that. Your lizard brain is the, the part of you that controls your primal drives. Remember this, all your reptile brain cares about is perpetuating your genes. Doesn't care about your immortal soul. Doesn't care about your coworkers. The things that get its attention the most is you. And by extension, the people you consider family. I have about 30 lawyers and probably a lot more by the end of this year winning multi-million dollar court cases understanding how to present using this principle. Okay? You present to the reptile brain. If you goose the reptile brain, the body goes into involuntary, unconscious responses that, for the most part, are honest, which means they're useful. Because anytime a person deviates from their normal mode of behavior, we can calibrate that, and that's what we need to start with. In kinesics, which is actually when I was deciding to go, I was, like I said, I was fascinated with, uh, did I answer your question, Ken? I forgot what it was. <laughs> Damn, I'm good! <laughs> That's called a lie of influence. No. But here, just think, think of it like the, 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 best, the best metaphor I can give you. You guys all know how pearls are made, right? Okay. In case you don't. A pearl is actually the result of something that's really irritating the hell out of the, out of the oyster. They get a little, grain of, a little grain of sand gets in there, and it irritates whatever is in there to be irritated, because I don't know that much about oyster anatomy, and I'm not sure I want to. <laughs> but they begin to, it begins to coat that, that grain of sand with a substance, and then another layer of that substance, and another layer of that substance. And even though the shape of that grain of sand may be squarish or rectangular or octa you know something not perfectly round by the time it's done you have this perfectly round sphere that looks nothing like what caused it well here's your pearl you have a primal drive that wants or needs to be satisfied you wrap emotion after emotion around it and then rationalization after rationalization after rationalization around it until finally the thing you can justify and defend acting on looks nothing like what caused you to want to do it in the first place. Okay, yes? Uh, this is a probably critique for me because uh, it's a pretty deep critique of, uh, of the enlightenment. It's a pretty cr deep critique of enlightenment? That's right. And not, in other words, like, the enlightenment seems to want us to believe that reason is the prime directive. And this seems to say, reason stands in a way, reason lies to us, and I'm tr sort of wondering the way you're telling, telling the narrative, what, will the world be better if we were just all stripped of, a, of reason and just go back to being... No, not at all, but we need to understand, we need to understand the part these things play. The problem that we have isn't that reason is bad, not at all. In fact, it's, it's our ability to use that rational part that allows us to solve problems allows us to come together and discuss things and talk and commune. It's not about that, okay? More often than not, the system works pretty well. But the problem that we have, when we talk about enlightenment, by the way, I would, but based on what you're telling me, you, you, could, you equate enlightenment with being rational. Would that be true? Well, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, okay, I don't. And not because I, I believe that the reptile should reign supreme, no. In the world according to David, and again, I'm going to do a little sidebar here. 
everything human beings do, the human, the human organism, ladies and gentlemen, is the world's largest, most complex, most fascinating information processing system on the planet. Okay? Most people believe that in order to um, become enlightened, we need to learn something. And that's mostly from the Descartian, I think, therefore I am approach. The problem is, of course, is that you keep looking for something outside of you. But what the other side of the coin says is that enlightenment isn't about adding something to the mix. It's about removing the filters to your perception, removing the filters to your awareness so that you can get the big picture, so you can see and understand and experience more. It's about becoming more aware of the world around you, becoming more aware of the different layers to reality, the illusion they like to call it. Okay? There's nothing wrong with the rat. It, 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 we wouldn't have developed it if it didn't work. But the, the problem is, of course, is that the wrong parts of us try to run the other parts. And so the pecking order and the way things are supposed to interact gets all bollocksed up. Okay? And now we're not talking about when the system, and in this, in this particular case, we're talking about when people are intentionally using this factor to mislead you, to do things that are not natural. Because lying is, as much as we like to think so, lying isn't something we do naturally as social creatures. Okay? All right. Um, so, great question, though. Thank you for that. I appreciate the. the and again, yes? It's a tiny question based on that last comment because that just jarred with me. Small children lie absolutely inherently. They drop something and you say to them, Did you drop that? And every child would look at me and say, No, no. And when you just said we don't lie naturally, that really shocked me. Can you tell when they're lying? Huh? Can you tell when they're lying? Mm -hmm. Oh, we start because we're so we're smart creatures, right? But is there a significant shift from their normal baseline behavior when they lie? Usually. Oh. Okay, we have places for people like that. They haven't learned to, oh wait, wait, they haven't learned to control themselves. There you go. It's the act of controlling your emotional response to telling a lie that allows it to be detected. Guess what we use to control our bodies and to control the lie? The neocortex, which by definition is the least informed part of you and the last to know. Okay? We lie to ourselves constantly. We couldn't function if we didn't. Now, in terms from a neurolinguistic standpoint, those lies take three different forms, not omission, although it kind of comes close. We do one of several things. We delete information, we distort it, or we generalize it. And the reason we do that is so when I want to say hello to, to art here, I don't, say, I don't have to say, hello to Art, a Hispanic gentleman sitting in my front row wearing a gray shirt with a name tag on that says Art, looking at me, wondering what the hell I'm talking about with an earring in his ear, you know, with, a, with a post in his eye. We streamline the information. We, we, st we save the file size down so it can be communicated. Does that make sense? That's all going on pre-consciously. Before you even become aware of anything I'm saying, your other than conscious mind has gone through myriad levels of filtering and sorting, deleting, distorting, and generalizing information to give you a facsimile of what you think I'm saying. And it's the parts that we share that we, we can communicate with, okay? But you're all doing this, okay? A lot of what I say is neuroscience, a lot of it I'll just make up, but you'll never know. Um, <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. I, you can back up. I'm going to give you lots and lots of resources. One of the best books I've seen out there right now is a book called Spy the Lie. I'm going to give you a lot of information from that book. I don't take credit for the synthesis. I take credit for the synthesis, not the source. Um, going back to my undergraduate days, I had a choice. I could either go into healthcare or I could go into law enforcement. And I took a lot of courses in kinesic interview and interrogation, which is basically getting information out of people who don't want to give it to you. Okay. One of the things that we do in kinesics 
is we determine what a, normal, a person's normal mode of behavior is, is. That's called a baseline. Without it, you can't do anything. Okay? So if you're gonna, if you're gonna just go around detecting lies and, and finding people who wanna lie to you or are in the process of lying to you, the body language cues and the verbal cues I'm gonna give you aren't going to be nearly as useful unless you've already established a baseline for what's normal for them. Does that make sense? The next concept, and one of the things that we do in kinesics, getting, you know, closing that loop a little bit, is if we're gonna interrogate you instead of just interview you, we're gonna do everything possible to amplify your stress level. Why? Because the more stress your body undergoes, the faster your conscious mind checks out. The faster you lose control of your body, your face, your hands, your words. Okay? All lies incur some level of, or addition of stress to the body. Okay? Now, people ask about psychopaths and sociopaths. There is a stress going on in their body, but it's different. Someone who's lying and who's not normally you know, used to lying or wants to lie, depending on the, the penalty for getting caught, how much time they've had to prepare, and how much emotion's involved in the issue, that'll cause leakage. That'll cause things to, they'll start to do things to alleviate that stress. They'll start to do things to psychologically or even sometimes physically distance themselves from you. Okay, we'll cover those. But we need to understand that what we're really looking at when we talk about lie detection, first and foremost, is stress. Okay, the next thing we need to look at is what is called the cluster rule. The cluster rule is this. No single cue by itself means anything. Okay, a lot of people, when they see this particular movement, um, what's this, what is this signal? Worry, doubt. Worry and doubt? Anybody else? Contemplation. Contemplation? Closed off? Hiding something. Okay. Who's right? They're all right or none of them are right. right? It really depends on your filters. What filters do you have in place in the, in the moment? How, what do you attribute to me? This goes back to that whole emotional refractory period you heard me mention. Here's what Dr. Ekman discovered. When you have an emotion, the first thing that happens, first of all, you never realize you've had an emotional shift until you're in it. You don't get a 10 second warning that says, warning, you are about to get pissed off. Danger, Real Robinson, danger. It okay? doesn't work that way. About 10, 15 seconds into the state, you suddenly realize you're pissed off, or you're sad, or you're upset. Right? But by then it's too late. Because then what we usually try to do is we marshal up our willpower and say, I shouldn't feel that way. Well, guess what? You're trying to control an emotion, aren't you? And your body will give it away. Always. The body does not lie. But there's an order and sequence of or levels of control that we have that works in an inverse order from what we pay attention to when we're, when we're sorting for lies. Most people sort from the face and the words. That's the wrong place to look. If you want to detect lies, start with the feet and work your way up. Start at your feet and work your way up. If I'm talking with, is it Marcy? Yes. If I'm talking with Marcy, and we're having a conversation, and maybe Marcy and I are dating, and I just came back from my chicky baby's place, you know? <laughs> and she's, she's kind of suspicious, because there's some weird things going on, and she can't explain it, right? And as I'm talking to her, and I'm telling her about, you know, how much I love her, and how, 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 how <laughs> see what happened? <laughs> right? Just that, so even though I'm facing her here, she's looking at my, now she knows, she has to actually look, she was actually focused on my face, and they said, wait a minute, look at the feet, right? That's what you did, isn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah. Just told me. Right, well, but, but you were focused yeah. here as I was talking to you, and then, you, and then this little voice in the back of your head said, look at the feet, and you went, Shh. right? Because that's what we do. When I'm talking to, is it Tiffany? When I'm talking to Tiffany, she's looking at my eyes, she's watching my mouth, she's listening to my words. She's not looking to see if I'm ready to bolt, right? She's not looking to see when she asks me a question that is uncomfortable for me that I do that. I distance myself. In order to lie, we have to control emotion. 
period, which is your first clue. Anytime you're talking to somebody and there's a sudden, obvious, emotional response, flag number one. Doesn't mean they're lying. It means they just had an emotional spike. Now, we don't know if it's because of something that happened in their childhood, which happens a lot, by the way. Many times when people have an emotional response, they don't realize they've had it. But like, because of people who come to my chair, it's always something that happened, a very emotional experience that they're remembering and superimposing that response in the present moment, okay? Emotional refractory period says that the moment I have an emotion, it becomes like a little life form in my head or in my body. And that life form wants to live and go on as long as possible. And so the first thing it will do is it will t start to tweak and modify, the, the big term is perceptual filters. Functionally, it's what we pay attention to, what comes to our attention first. It will change what we pay attention to so that we only focus on the things in the communication, the situation, or the environment that reinforce or re-trigger the emotional state I'm in. So if we're talking to somebody who we love and we want to love us back and we want the relationship to work and they're giving us, and, and, and they gave us that goose of dopamine and serotonin and all those happy love chemicals, right? How much do we want to call them on their bullshit? We don't, right? And then they tell us something. It's like, okay. Whereas your friend who's sitting across from going, he's lying to you, baby. <laughs> right? And you go, no, no, he would never do that. He loves me. <laughs> or she loves me, right? By the way, guys, two thirds of all approaches are initiated by women. Did you know that? No, you didn't. That's why you're single. <laughs> 80% of all breakups are initiated by women, okay? Guys, those of you who ever want to do anything extracurricular in your lives, I'm going to give you an important safety tip. Conversely, ladies, I'm going to give you a safety tip of what to look for. <laughs> I don't believe I'm giving this shit. <laughs> when do men, and, and my, my good friend Mike Packard, guys, uh, you're going to hear me reference some stuff, but Mike runs some really cool meetups and some really cool things on how to protect yourself. Um, talk to him afterwards. He's got some, some really cool seminars coming up. But Mike invited me to a seminar where I, I met a, a gentleman by the name of Jason Hansen, who was uh, six years ex-CIA. And we had a real good talk and a real good seminar. He gave this little, I'm going I'm to teach you what I call the Hansen 15, which is a great way to start learning how to catch people lying. But one of the things he talks about is when guys are going to cheat, check their cell phone. Look for any calls or texts between the, the hours of 8.30 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. Because they're going on their way to work and they're making plans or they're on their way home and they're making plans. Okay? Guys, ditch the phone! <laughs> Or don't cheat. <laughs> don't even start me on starting on that one. <laughs> By the way, you know 68% of all people will cheat and enjoy it, right? Only 68. Well, those are the ones that report it and are honest about it. <laughs> it's like that old, it's like that old masturbation rule, you know? 80% of all of all people masturbate, and the other 20% lie. It's kind of relevant, but <laughs> all right. So. The reason we have to talk about the emotional refractory period is because your emotions will color what you pay attention to. It will color the data that you receive. You will start to rationalize based on the feelings you've got about the truth or untruth based on the body language cues you're getting, okay? So one of the things you need to do, if you're going to decide to look for lies, for deceptive behavior, you must only focus on the lies. You must disregard the truth. Okay, we call that the, another, in, in uh, other, other psychology terms, we call it attribution bias. Okay, yes? 
Can I go back for a second? No. If but women are cheating, when do they use a the phone? They don't. <laughs> They're the ones getting called. What about the sixth sense that we all have? That's our income. That, that's what we, have we all have it. We all have it. Um, but a lot of us, it's atrophied. And we override it. This part has that one power. It overrides what our feelings are telling us. That's one of the powers it has. It's where we choke a lot of times when it comes to like physical skills and things where we have to rely on our bodies. Again, when all the parts are working and they're communicating properly, the system works really well. It's when we parts refuse to accept or communicate appropriately that the system tends to break down. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so you got to keep your emotions in check. Also, don't ask a question you don't want to know the answer to. Okay? Because many times, how many people ever have ever caught somebody in a lie, or followed up on information, and were sorry they asked? Right? That shit will come back to haunt you. Okay? Shit being a technical term, secret hidden influence technique. Right? I've had time to prepare, guys. Uh, all right, so we've talked about baselines, right? We've got to figure out what is the standard we're going to measure by, okay? Talked about, we started talking about clusters. Clusters, no single body language cue by itself means anything. So when we start to make body language cues to make them meaningful, we have to have our baseline. I'm going to keep repeating this because this is where everybody screws up. Even trained neurolinguistic programmers, when they're trying to do thing, really weird things like eye accessing cues, or sorting through language patterns, or calibrating emotional response, or whether something worked, they don't get a baseline. They don't calculate deviance from, from the norm. The next thing is clusters. We're looking for body language cues or verbal cues of two to five. Two to five cues. That creates a cluster. Okay? What we're also looking for is we're looking for behaviors or cues that are A, repeated, and timely. Okay? So, for instance, if I at, yes? Yeah, within a, within, a, within a space of one to 10 seconds after the words or before the words, when does the behavior manifest? That's when it's relevant. As a rule, the body always answers first. And if, it's, if, they, if they process really fast, at or about the same time as the words come out. Yes? A question on that. Um, I had someone point that out to me, that I cross my arms before I talk to somebody mm -hmm. because I don't trust what they're going to say. Well, that, that's a leap. And so, <laughs> but it's, it's a normal response for me. Mm -hmm. and I can't like overwrite that, well, even no, though I know I'm going to do it. Well, first of all, are they right? Okay. I mean, not that you cross your arms, but that you distance yourself. Or, or what's the word they use? Yeah, they, 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 they brought up that every time I, any time I talk to somebody or a coworker or something like that, that I automatically cross my arms and wait for what they're going to tell me. Mm -hmm. Because they say, because you're not trusting anything that person is going to say. Okay. So and is that really true? Pretty much. Pretty much? Yeah. But you didn't cross your arms now. Mm -hmm. Do you because trust me? You're not going to tell me. I'm not going to tell you anything that what? <laughs> that you might not already know. Okay. Then why are you here? <laughs> Do you want to stop doing that? Yes. Okay. I want to stop. All the time? Really? She's bringing up some interesting, I'm, I'm asking her some very pointed questions because the thing you need to understand is that these, these, these stress response or these defensive mechanisms, behaviors that we have, they're not bad. They're utilitarian. There may be times and places where that behavior is dramatically appropriate. There's no such thing as a good or bad behavior. It just isn't. It doesn't work that way. There's either useful or not useful. And useful and not useful is based on the context. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so uh, in terms of timely, as a rule, 
the physical body will answer first. Usually one, yeah. usually a half, one to half a second before the words that come out of our mouth, there will be a nod or a shift or something that indicates that a verbal response is coming. Okay? When it doesn't, when the physical body answers after, now flags should start going off. Okay? If you get somebody who says, well, this is, here's a good one. Maybe you guys remember this. I am not a criminal. <laughs> or a crook, right? I am not a crook. Right? Or maybe, I did not have sex with that woman. <laughs> right? What you'll see a lot of times is they'll say things like, um, I did not have sex with that woman, and then the head will go. <laughs> see the incongruity of it? That's that sixth sense you're talking about. There's an inherent, the reptilian brain is the one that does this, by the way. There's an inherent sense of what's right or what, what is formed naturally and what is formed unnaturally. Yes? The reptilian brain nodded? Mm -hmm. the one that yeah, the reptilian brain can't lie. In, in, the, in the sense that we think of, very complex lies, right? It, it runs the body. The body answers first. By the time a lie comes out of your mouth, you have gone through mo Do you understand how hard a liar has to actually work to pull off a lie? Think Enron, guys. Think about all the stories you have to keep straight, all the sidelines, all the by, you know, he said, she said, times and dates. You want to <coughs> screw up a liar after they've told you this great story? Have them tell it to you in reverse. Seriously. Scientifically, somebody who has created a lie, a fabrication, in a story, narr in a narrative form, every time they were tried, they, they were asked to repeat the events of the story in reverse, they failed. Because in order to lie, people, I'm sorry, aren't there people that are chronic liars where they have a hard time telling the truth? Yes, absolutely. You, it's, it's harder. Remember, we're, we're talking about the tip of a really big iceberg here, right? Uh, psychopaths exist. We have, a, we have a workshop coming up in, a, in two or three weeks. I'm going to show you some things that you can do to spot the soci sociopaths and the psychopaths. We, it's too much for this, this training. Does that make sense? We need to look at the average normal human being we're most likely to face. Which, by the way, there's a lot more sociopaths out there than you realize. Yeah. Most of them are in business. Yeah. 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 When you saw and heard Clinton say he did not have sex, Red Lewinsky. Did you believe him, and how did you? I think I was on a date at the time, so I was kind of. <laughs> but actually, there's an interesting uh, one of the, uh, a body language expert who I greatly respect, a guy by the name of Kevin Hogan, actually did analyze that particular segment. And through the the whole uh, the whole thing, every time Clinton was making a statement that was true, he would go, "I did not this, and I did not that," and as soon as he lied. Yeah. His, his neurology changed because his brain, the way he was using his brain changed. Remember, all physical body language is brain language, but it's, it's not the level of the brain we're used to living and experiencing the world from. I spend a lot of time and a lot of energy putting people in touch with the parts of themselves that they've lost touch with, that they're miscommunicating with. That's what I do. Okay, I do it in the martial arts, I do it in therapy, I do it for chronic and, and pain. Yes. I have thought about what you're talking about. It would be very difficult to spot an actor, for example. Absolutely. They, they are so natural. They can lie so natural because that's their job. They are trained to do that. So mm -hmm. you can never. Actually, some of them you can. But most, if they've had time to prepare, no, you won't, you won't find a lot of, of cues. So there's women that are married to actors. I would want to you know. Well, think of, look, look at the average lifestyle of an actor, right? <laughs> <laughs> Former actor, <laughs> right? But here's my point, is this is something we want to begin to pay attention to, but we can't do it if we're caught up in the story. All right, how many stories have I told up here and you got yourself sucked in? Right? That's how easy it is. Anytime somebody launches into a narrative, the conscious part of our brain tends to shut off. We engage the imagination. We need, in this case, we need to actually go into super uptime awareness. We need to activate our own rational factor to be able to parse information that's coming to at us through different channels we're not used to consciously paying attention to. 
takes energy. And you should only do this if you're willing to follow up and, and, and be prepared for the answer. Yes? So you have to look for when it happens after? That's the cue? Yeah. Not during? Uh, well, a lot of times, I'll, I'll bring up one of, the, one of my favorite ones, because my wife is guilty of this. And she's in the back, so she, I'm going to have a hard night at home after I do this. But um, <laughs> one of the things that you'll see a lot of times are these what we call analog movements or head nods. Okay? Somebody says, I did not have sex with that woman. Right? Sometimes, sometimes it's an obvious mismatch. Sometimes what's happening is they're feeling a strong emotion, and then head nod is an emphasis of that emotion. Like if they're really repulsed by something, they might, they might give you an affirmative answer, but nod their head no. That's usually, that's usually limited to yes and no questions. They have to say yes. Have to say yes. Mm -hmm. Or while they're saying it. However, when they're giving you a story, where they're giving you a narrative, where they're telling you about how their car broke down, you know, and, and they were waiting and waiting and waiting for somebody to come and help them, and nobody came. Now, how many got, got sucked into my words about the, the store or about the, nobody coming? How many were watching my head? Mm. Only two or three of you were watching my head nods. <laughs> why? You got sucked into the story. This is why catching lies is so hard. Did anybody come? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's called an open loop. Finish the damn story! It's like that old saying, hey, you guys know how to keep an idiot in suspense? <laughs> no. You guys are actually the smart ones for being here. Right? But timeliness is important. Remember, the unconscious mind always answers first. Always. If you get a five second lag, danger, Will Robinson, means start to pay attention. If it comes like up to 10 seconds after the verbal response, now we got to start looking for stuff, right? So what I want to do now is we understand the baseline principle, we understand the emotional refractory period, how easy it is to want to believe the people that we're communicating with, right? We understand clustering. Now let's talk about what I call the Hansen 15. First one that, that Jason taught us, and I've see, you'll see this a lot. Actually, I'll, I'll give you another funny story. How many people are here? I don't know, he's one of my off-color, politically incorrect metaphors. How many people here have ever been in an enclosed space where a foul odor suddenly appears? <laughs> and everybody, almost, you know, you're just, you're just sitting there going, right? Except for one guy who's in the corner going, <laughs> and he's taking up as little space as humanly possible. It's like somebody glued his feet to the ground, right? And he's the first one out the door. When the door. That's called the freeze. When people express themselves, naturally, they tend to gesture. They tend to move. They tend to own the space around them until they lie. Liars, by nature, don't want their stuff investigated. They don't want you delving deeper into the story or the fabrication that they're giving you. So consciously, they're going to do things that make you look in another direction. Unconsciously, right with you. Unconsciously, they're going to do things that won't call attention. Look for the arms and legs to stop moving. They'll be frozen in place. Okay? These are the most common things. They're not everything. Yes, sir? I, I had a pair of friends who, one of them was a labor negotiator. Uh-huh. And, uh... That tells me a lot right there. One, one... He and his wife gets into kind of disagreement. She will ask him, you're not negotiating with me, are you? I mean, I'm asking this question. It seems right to be suspicious of others you don't know. Mm -hmm. But in a relationship, you, want, you apply these techniques. Is that out of bounds in, in, in this sense? Because you're in a relationship that's supposed to be trusting. Mm -hmm. And if you're applying these techniques, it already indicates there's a lack of trust. So she, her question was very appropriate. I mean, you're not negotiating at this point, are you? I mean, we're in a relationship. Say the negotiation for when you're dealing with a labor relationship. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to ask you, how do you deal with this sort of situation when you 
uh, when you're dealing with sub supposedly somebody you're in a relationship, mm -hmm. I mean, at what point do you apply these techniques? When you have a suspicion, period. When you suspect something's not right, that's when you apply these techniques, right? Now, I'm not going to say that every now and then I just randomly throw a test out there and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> this means yes, this means no, right? I, I told you, this, this had relevance, right? I test constantly. Most of the time, my tests are passed, no problem. They don't have to be strong tests. But if you, know, pa if you start to notice patterns, and those patterns of behavior bother you, there's something nagging about it. Your body almost always knows. There are many times, by, by the way, some t we have to learn to tell the difference between an emotional memory and an actual intuitive response. Because many times one masquerades as the other. Yes? I, I could argue that when you're throwing out the test, you're, you're already out of bounds in the relationship. I'll, I'll give an example. When I was teaching at, I'll, I'll not say the college, and uh, me and this other, other faculty were not agreeing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so a third faculty who was a senior faculty calls me to his office and start reciting some of the nasty thoughts I have of the other guy. They recited the nasty thoughts uh, you yeah. have of the and, other guy. And so I asked him, like, and how did you find this out? Mm -hmm. And it turns out that this guy had went through my, my uh, trash bin and found what I wrote down. And I said, well, this is out of bounds. Mm -hmm. This is illegal for him to even come into my yes. private information, right? Mm -hmm. So in a sense, what I'm asking is that if you're in a relationship that's supposed to be trusting, mm -hmm. in a sense, you've already broken the first rule. Now, maybe the other person did break the first rule by doing something weird mm -hmm. to begin with, right? It seems to me you should have a kind of more trusting, honest we talk. And then if they don't do anything, then maybe you should put these things to the test. In a perfect Otherwise, world, it would probably be that way, right? In a perfect world, we wouldn't need to lie, right? If, we, if all of us had you know, perfect characters, you know, a lot of this stuff would be moot. But we don't live in a world like that. And the, what, what you're giving us, by the way, is not, you're not wrong, but what you're really sharing with us are your values about how you think the world should be. And that's OK. So you're saying everybody lies? Something? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I don't lie. <laughs> Trust me, you may not think of them as lies. Most of the lies that we tell are not harmful. Well, I mean, lately. Lately. Oh, wait. That's called, that's called qualifying. I, I am saying, when I was younger, you know, maybe I said, I did say some lies. Mm -hmm. But I still grow older, I realize that it's better just to say things. That I would agree with you. I, I rarely lie. Yeah. <laughs> but it's important to understand that not everybody sees the world the way you do. Like, I'm going to tell you right now, and, I, and it's going to piss some of you off. Y'all lie. Y'all do it. It's just a question of degree and how conscious of it you are that you're actually lying. You ever frame something so somebody will get a certain perception of, of a situation? All the time. That is my MO. I never lie. I tell you to be misled by making totally true statements that imply something. I never consciously lie, but I deliberately mislead people. Remember, the hardest, the hardest lie to tell. We, this is what we're doing all the time. We're deleting, distorting, in general. We're skewing the data that we transmit to people. Because the hardest lie to tell is the one that is deliberately, obviously, totally, completely, Contra to the truth. It's the hardest one to tell. It's the hardest one to defend and to justify to ourselves. So what do we do? We leave out information so they never bother to think or question us about it. Or we give them a set of facts in such a way that they're predisposed to filtering and, and acting on that information in a way that creates a story that has nothing to do with the facts, but everything to do with the fact. Yes. Yeah. Most people do. Except those of us who are self-employed. But even then we do it, all right?
It's called marketing. <laughs> all right, guys, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not, I'm not saying that you're all dishonest people. I'm not, I'm not implying that in the least. I believe you're all very, very honest people. But in order to function in this, if somebody asks you, when is the last time somebody came up and says, how do I look? And they look like hell, and you said, you look like hell. <laughs> right? Or you, found, or, or you found something about them that did look nice and focused on that one piece and let them assume you were talking about the whole package. <laughs> or, or, if, or, or if you prefer to be honest, you say, well, you don't look that good today. You don't look that good today, okay? Right? You could do that. How many people do that? Wow! Look around. That's me. You about six. Do what you said. Oh, I do that. Okay. Yes. When you're not in your head, can it go either way? It's like just the fact that the head's either going back and forth. The fact that the head is nodding is, is means that there's something being processed unconsciously. Now, in terms of the head nod, if it's a yes-no denial, then if there's a real strong emotion connected to it, many times what the nod is connected to is the emotion that they feel. Okay. So if um, um, I think that, if I'm thinking about something, that's something horrible that somebody did and I'm asked my opinion about it, I may, I may nod my head and say, that motherfucker should be dead, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But what, I, what the nod is for is the emotion that I'm feeling. It's an expression of what I'm feeling. Does that make sense? Right. Whereas if I'm telling a more complex story and I'm talking about how, how my car broke down and nobody would come and pick me up, right? Or, you know, I, I didn't have sex, I didn't have sex with my secretary because, you know, I, I'm happily married. Right? You can also distort the truth when you are under stress. Absolutely. You you are you have I just happen to you have so much stress that you should What did we say at the beginning of the meetup? The fat the more stress that enters the system, the faster the conscious mind checks out. Mm -hmm. Now, again, when we're talking, there's this thing we call Othello's Flaw. How many people have ever seen the Shakespearean show Othello? Well, it's the reality. what happens is if somebody is stressed out enough, they can give indicators that would imply deception when in fact they're just so stressed out and they're telling the truth. We call that Othello's Flaw, Othello's Error. Okay. So that's why baseline is really, really important. You need to know the person you're going you're to pursue. So I mean blowing out everything out of proportion because of the stress that comes in. So the, the, you, you, are not saying it's, you are not saying the truth, you're just blowing it out of proportion. Well, blowing it out of proportion is a distortion of the truth, isn't it? Yeah. Which is what every human being does anyway. It's a question of how much do they, how much do they express it. Because of the stress. Mm -hmm. Right? We're distorting or we're, we're magnifying or modulating the perception we're giving. Now, many times when, like, when they're doing what she's doing, it doesn't go to lie detection per se, but it does go to a lot to how they're representing that experience in their own head. Does that make sense? Yes? Something I've seen frequently in other people, friends, and myself is um, where you're in a situation where uh, you basically, somebody accuses you of something and mm -hmm. you smile mm -hmm. because you don't know how to respond. Yes, that's a stress response. Okay. It's a stress response. Anytime you, 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 you present somebody with some information and they do something completely out of the norm, it's a stress response. The question is, what's the motive behind it? Is there, is, are there, is there something they're trying to control? Are they completely taken aback? You know, these are the things we need to, you, you, you gotta begin to delve deeper, right? So, the freeze, getting back to this. You, get, you confront somebody with something, they tell you some form of a truth or untruth, and they just stop moving. They just free, they, they, their body movement just, like somebody hit the off switch. And the only thing moving is their lips. Okay, that's called the freeze. Okay, one red flag. By the way, I love your questions. You guys are asking some great questions. Just keep in mind, the more questions I have to answer, the less information that I have written down, I can give you. But is this good stuff so far? Yes. Yes. Okay, I don't want to bore you. So what is 15, hands on 15? Yeah, I call it the hands on 15 app because in honor of the guy I learned it from. Uh, a lot of this stuff is repeated in many other books and, and on the internet and things like that. Um, another thing that tends to happen is, and this might happen a lot with uh, spouses, you know, spouses are having an argument and they're usually cuddly feely. You know, me and Marcy are hanging out lovey dovey and then she asks me a question and I refuse to touch her. Right? They just stop. Right? It's a distancing effect. 
because there's some part of us that feels that information could be passed on. She could figure out what's going on and get it. What she doesn't realize is if she understands how to, how to do the baseline and how to look for clusters, those things will happen on them. That will actually send up the red flag. Okay? Remember, when someone has to lie, and, and the, the, the ability, the, the odds of them getting caught or leaking are directly proportional to A, the payoff, the penalty, and how much preparation time they've had. Okay? Now, that being said, if somebody has prepared a story, it's actually easy to catch. Because if you know what their normal mode of speaking is and how they normally respond, and all of a sudden their, their speech pattern picks up and it's flawless, they prepared something in advance. Like an actor. Yes? What if there's, you, you know he's a liar, and all of a sudden his speech pattern changes to extreme emotional stress? Yep, he's lying. That's called overreaction. Okay? That's one of the ways that liars dissuade you from, provoke, from following up on that line of questioning. How many times you ask somebody something and they've got completely indignant, you got so scared or so upset that you upset them, you stop questioning. Yeah. Very common response when somebody's got their cojones in the noose. Question? Mm -hmm. Sir, you in the orange? No, oh, I didn't want to say. You, but you know what's interesting? I, I had a, uh, I was in a relationship with uh, somebody that would test whether it's telling the truth by making just lying to yeah. me about what my behavior was. Well, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And it's like, I knew she was lying because she's making a general statement about me and I can put up with it half an hour, hour, five hours, and finally I can get so freaking goddamn pissed off and just get mad. Yeah. She would come out of my mouth, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that was her gauge. Sounds like you took it too far. Uh, yeah. Right. Here's the point: is when 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 you ask somebody a question, and if and if they if they haven't had a lot of time to prepare, you're going to see more emotion than if they have. Does that make sense? The more time, and and also, depending on your reputation as somebody who can who's a bullshit detector, again, it goes to their fear of being caught and the the desire for the payoff. But remember, it's all about stress. It's all about emotion. The more stress you can introduce into the interaction, the more honest the body language becomes because you lose the ability to control it. Okay? And it starts from the bottom up. So remember, feet, legs, torso, shoulders, hands, face. And then finally, words. Okay? Um, squinting. You ask them a question, they go, Right? By the way, do you see what my body did? Right? See how subtle? That's two, that's a cluster right there. I squinted, I kind of tensed a little bit, and I backed up a little bit. Warning. You'll see this when people go through any kind of intense analytical functions also. So again, it doesn't necessarily mean they're lying. It does mean that they're doing a lot more cognitive processing. Make sense? They're looking, they're thinking about what you're saying, they're thinking about what they're gonna say, and figuring out, okay, how do I, fit, how do I swing this? Right? Eyes. This is the one that, for some reason, people never seem to get. If they stare at you like you're freaking, like they're trying to stare you down, it's like, I am telling you the truth. Am I telling, how many people, how many people have heard the thing, uh, uh, someone who's a, bad, a good liar, or a, who, someone who's lying can't look you in the eyes? I've heard that. That's something only, only bad liars say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Actually, that's the first thing we, we, we learn to control because we're taught that from the time we're, we're this freaking tall. So good liars will look you in the eye. In fact, they will probably overlook you in the eye. What you might want to start to pay attention to, though, is when they're looking you in the eyes, what are their eyelids doing? Are they fluttering a little bit? Are they kind of darting a little bit? What do their pupils look like? Pupils tend to dilate when we experience polarities of two basic emotions. Attraction, something we like, and fear. If you're looking at somebody, and it's obviously not a romantic situation, and their pupils have completely taken over, 
There is no color left but that big black hole. That's scary. You wouldn't be surprised to see a small yellow puddle forming at the base of their feet. <laughs> Chances are you caught them in something they don't want to talk about, though they want to go. Okay? All right? This autonomic, you can't control it. Although I found a way to do it, but <laughs> it still takes practice. Um, okay, so that's four, right? Um, plus or minus two. Do not accuse a person. You need them. Uh, I'll guess this is the thing. When we when we start to um, look for deception or sort for deception, unless you're in an interrogatory in an interrogatory environment, you probably don't want to be very in your face and accuse people of lying. Because then you can start to generate false negatives and things like that um, and really make your job harder, right? So you want to almost be there, you know, be all, you know, just very, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, kind, uh, nice, <coughs> understanding. One of the common tactics you see this, you've watched any cop show where they put somebody in the in, in, the, in the interrogation room, you'll see them start to talk about, you know, and I can understand why you might, you know, smack that kid around. I have kids, and I know sometimes they get me so mad. You know, one time my kid did this, and I was so mad I wanted to put him through. I can completely understand why you might want to, you know, punish him a little bit and make sure he doesn't do that again. Because unconsciously, when we know we're lying, we're looking for anyone on the planet to believe us, anyone to support us. And as, un, as illogical as it, makes, as it seems to be, because the reptile brain's always looking for a society to back him up, the minute he sees or he feels like he's being accepted, understood, the guard starts to go down and they start to volunteer information. Now, um, I have this little sneaky thing I do when I talk to people, is I just tell them their words back to them. And every time I tell them their words back to them, they give me more information. And then they give me more information. Sure. Every time I talk to somebody, I do as, I, as often as I can, as consistently as I can, I mirror their words back to them. So I'm coming back here to talk to you. Is that OK? Look at her. She just got a warm, fuzzy feeling. Didn't you? <laughs> so yeah, she's still smiling ear to ear, right? Why? Because neurologically, the sweetest words we can hear are the ones that come out of our own mouth. It's how you're hardwired. And even if you know I'm doing it, after a while, you just won't care. And you'll start to feel that I understand you, that I get you, that we believe in the same things. And you'll start to want to make sure I understand everything. And before you know it, you're on your way to the lockup because at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter whether I commiserate with you, whether I share your views. The law says this. You either did it or you didn't. You did? OK. I don't care why. I'm not saying you can use that tactic, that it might be useful. Um, this is, that actually isn't on here. This is one, this is one from David's world. Um, but if you want to get a job interview, even if you're not qualified, or win a job interview, even if you're not qualified for it, you know, want to get somebody to really like find you the most fascinating person in the room, even if you're boring as toast, I'm not saying that'll work. This means yes, this means no, come out of trance, okay? Uh, but if you want to start to develop that feeling of I'm on your side, and then you start to soften some of your questioning tactics, and you start to pay attention for a deviation when they start to get stressed out, when they start to, when those traits start to amplify. Now you'll have a better idea of where to pursue and what not to pursue. Does that make sense? The, the reason I'm giving you these first is because they're the biggest, they'll, they'll send up flags. They're flags that you, you can just learn to focus on and then you can add more techniques and more ways of finding information and collecting and, and understanding by language as the system progresses. Does that make sense? My goal is to give you something that you can go out and start using tonight. Does that make sense? Because otherwise, we've just had a really cool lecture. And by the way, I, I started these meetings because I like to do cool stuff. Anybody here like to do cool stuff? Yeah. Cool. You like to meet, hang out with cool people who like to do cool stuff? Yeah. This means yes. This means no. This is, oh, shit, I don't know. 
All right. Um, another thing that liars will do, and this has probably happened to many of you many times, and you just didn't see it. They will block you. What does that mean? Let's say that uh, what's your, R Renee and I are, are in a, a hot and, and passionate romance. <laughs> and she's suspecting that I'm out there doing vile things to vile people for vile reasons. Right? And uh, I come home from a hard day of work. And she, goes, and she confronts me on some of the work. Where have you been? So, Where have you been? Um, I just had to stop by the store. For what? Who saw it? Yeah. 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 I just put something between me and her. Right? It can be a jacket. It can be a chair. It could be a glass. It could be, could be sitting, you know, we could be sitting at the table having a drink, and all of a sudden, my eyes are not, it's Holly? Holly. Holly asked me, uh, you know, if I, ask, if I think that, that blonde across the, the way is really attractive, and I go, what blonde? <laughs> <laughs> right? Innocuous, right? By the way, you'd be amazed at what you can find out by watching a glass. Okay? When I teach my attraction class, there's seven body language stages that all couples go through from complete stranger to wanting to do the horizontal mambo together. Okay? And a lot of it has to do with how they move the, relation, the objects in relationship to one another. One of the ladies that, uh, uh, who was part of my early mastermind group, which I'll, I'll tell you about later on, um, she owns a wine bar. And I was teaching this particular principle. And uh, she goes to me, you know what? You are so right. I watch these people come in on first dates, and at the beginning of the night, he's on one side of the table and she's on the other, and by the end of the night, their wine glasses are side by side, and they leave together, arm in arm, okay? Body language is just learning to understand patterns and pattern recognition, okay? And we have patterns for romance, we have patterns for lying, we have patterns for pretty much everything human beings engage in. It's just nobody taught you, but they're going on in plain sight. Yes? Uh, blocking, would that equally include shifting to put something between you? Yes. Anything that puts an object of some kind, even your own body. So if I'm, I don't have my chair, but if I'm talking with Renee, and she asks me, that, you know, where have I been or whatever, well, I had to go, okay. right? You'll see this a lot. Many times there'll be a, the, the body language thing I gave you guys earlier where I did this, it's called a triple cross. That counts as three distinct body language cues. Remember, to be, to be relevant to our process of detecting lies, we have to have how many? Two to five. Two to five. I got a three banger right there. Right? Now, could it also be that they're cold? Yeah. But do they only do it when you ask them a question? Remember, is the behavior repeated? And does it happen within a five to 10 second window before or after they verbally answer? Got it? Okay. Questions? Is this useful? Yes. You wouldn't lie to me, would you? <laughs> I know. Here's, here's what I ask. If you had a good time tonight, post good things to the meetup. If you didn't have a good time tonight, post to somebody else's. <laughs> okay, uh, we, just co we covered head shake, so that's important. But again, we're looking for timeliness. Does the shaking occur at the right time? Yes? Is that shaking just back and forth or up or down? Yes, but the problem, that, and the problem that we have with this one, aside from the fact, I'm sorry, aside from the fact that uh, is it a yes or no versus a narrative? Mm -hmm. Is that many times in different cultures, this does not mean yes. So I don't like, as a rule, to teach body language techniques that are culturally based. I like to teach body language that is based on evolution. So whether you're from Papua New Guinea, uh, Finland, Russia, uh, the Middle East, what, means it, what, what a body language cue means there means everywhere else. I like universals. I don't like to have to think too much. 
See, there's two ways to keep people stuck. You don't give them enough information or too much. Either way, progress bogs down. Okay? Um, that being said, let's take a five minute break. Let's go get you guys some coffee and some sugar and go potty and we'll come back and we'll get into some other really cool stuff. Thank you.